Well, we're going to go ahead and, and start this evening. And uh, again, thank you so much for being flexible and enjoying joining us in, in this way virtually. I think all of us are getting a little more used to doing this, uh, but we are very glad to have you with us for the February uh, 2021 Neighborhood Leadership Gathering. Uh, this evening, we will welcome the mayor here in a, in a couple minutes and she will greet us, but we also have Council Member Conrad Lee with us tonight as well. Good evening, Council Member. Good evening. Hi. Also with us uh, helping this evening and, and part of our team is our Assistant Director, Mike mccormick uh, who's working a lot of the behind the scenes things that make it so much easier for us. So good evening, Mike, as well from Neighborhood Services. So this evening, um, just always want to remind and thank for the staff that are helping us this evening, particularly our neighborhood liaisons, the team that I get to work with, uh, the four of us. I'm Mark Heilman, neighborhood outreach manager, and then Julie Ellenhorn, also a liaison, uh, is the person that's responsible for putting together uh, these neighborhood leadership gatherings. Teresa Cuthill, and Carol Ross, each of us have different responsibilities, but one of the ones that we want to emphasize is, is that you can contact us at the email address that's the very bottom of your page right now. Um, each of us work in about a quarter of the city. Uh, if you have questions or something that we can help you find the right person to get your answer on, we would be very glad to do that. Um, assisting with neighborhood leadership, and associations, and then a number of events that we do throughout the year, including this one tonight. So welcome. We're glad to have you with us. A couple of things as far as this environment. If you would please go to the very bottom of your screen to the left uh, and hit the mute button. That helps us to uh, not hear any pets that you have joining you this evening. We will have an opportunity at the very end of the evening for us to, to greet and talk again. And then at the center of the bottom of your screen is the chat feature. You're welcome to enter questions in or comments throughout the evening. And we will have questions for our speaker this evening. Uh, so if you have questions or things that you would like to highlight, very much encourage you to enter into the chat feature. And then just to the right, a couple of spots. Uh, again, at the bottom of your screen, you can highlight it and there is closed captioning, which, which says live transcript. So if you'd like to hit on that and then you will have the text uh, at the very bottom of the screen of what is said this evening. And if you haven't put in your name, we would love to be able to know who is on with us, um, who is on with us this evening. Do want to let you know that this evening is being recorded uh, from this point forward. Uh, so that we can share with other folks. So as most of you know, um, many of you have been with us in the past, but we also have some new folks. Typically, we would be meeting on the first floor of, of City Hall uh, in D108. We typically set up for about 60 people and we're at tables, we have a presentation. And after that presentation, we will ask the presenter some questions or have suggestions, which are wonderful ways for the city to learn from you in a very casual environment. But then we also go to discussion, which we're going to do this evening as well. Uh, typically in the past, prior to going uh, remote last spring, we had discussions around, uh, the topic was talking about trees uh, about a year and a half ago in environmental stewardship. And then uh, last February, our neighborhood leadership gathering was about the budget process for the next biennium. So those are some of the topics that we typically have. It's opportunity for the city to share with you a little more in-depth information, but also to learn what is on your mind as well. So this evening, um, all of us are very aware we have come through 2020 with some profound challenges, COVID, um, challenges within around the globe, challenges within our country and in our city, and opportunities for us to respond to inequities and deepening relationships in ways that are understanding one another. We've had real varied stressors and inequitable stressors and undoubtedly we have had very individualized processing and routines that have helped us get through the last 11 months. But I would say, I would just underscore that each of the opportunities that we have had to meet ever so briefly only, and safely only, on out in the community. We have appreciated and we look forward to those opportunities in the future as, as you do with your family and loved ones as well. 
So tonight, uh, we are looking forward to learning um, some additional coping strategies that may be helpful that you can um, add to the ways that you are dealing with the things that are very challenging in our world right now. And to uh, provide an introduction and welcome, we're very glad to have Mayor Lynn Robinson with us. Um, it was, I think, about six or seven weeks into her term um, as newly sworn in mayor that the world started to tilt upside down. So we're very glad to have her with us this evening. And uh, so, Teresa, if you want to go to our next slide, and I will mention some of our resources right after she speaks. So good evening and welcome, Mayor Lynn Robinson. Well, thank you. And I, I, there was no direct causation between my becoming mayor and COVID hitting, just to make that clear. But what, a, what an incredible year it's been. We gathered here last fall for our first leadership neighborhood leadership gathering. And I think we felt like we were hitting our second wave and, and going to be through with this soon. And here we are in uh, almost March. And the good news is the numbers really are dropping quite quickly. We need to maintain our vigilance, but uh, it is good news. The vaccination program that our emergency services partnered with the county to do has been extremely effective. And I just want you to know that if you or somebody you know qualifies for a vaccination and is unable to get an appointment, if you email me, lrobinson at bellevuewa.gov, uh, there are a lot of volunteer community groups who are helping people to get their appointments and I can connect you to them. But I wanna thank staff for putting this program on. It's, it's just a remarkable program. Um, you know, I'm so proud to be a part of the Bellevue community, the response that our city had to all the challenges that we've all been through over the last year and a, and a quarter um, have been so inspiring. I know I was at a leadership conference with another mayor from a large city across the lake that shall go unnamed. And they talked about their response being every man for themselves or every, that's what they said, every person for themselves, I guess. But I said, you know, Bellevue, it really wasn't that way. Everybody reached out to help e each other, whether it was neighbors helping neighbors or employers or uh, civil uh, organ civic organizations, our hospitals, our, our EMTs, our restaurants. It's just, and you know, it's, it's, it's made us who we are today. We're, we're getting through this. It's not easy, but we're doing it. And we we're doing it because we're strong together. And so I just hope that we can continue to be strong together to get across the finish line. And I'm really happy to have this event tonight. I hope that you're able to take away some valuable information, uh, create connections and get the information you need to continue to get through this. And I just thank you for participating. And I just want you to know it's an honor to serve you. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I would say from a personal standpoint, uh, we have mentioned a few times that it, it seems like the, the right council with the right mix at the right time that's worked together well with different backgrounds and personalities. So we are very grateful for each of the seven of you all. So thank you. If we could please go back to the resource slide, uh, we would like for you to know that there are a number of other opportunities uh, for you to get resources. Um, our diversity team has underscored these, uh, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and you see the, the link there. We will send these out to you in an email after this evening. Uh, Persons of Color Online Classroom, uh, The Arc of King County, Washington Listens, which is an opportunity to discuss with folks. And then this is a 24 hour hotline, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, uh, either online or a phone number, an 800 number that you can call at any time. Again, we will send that out to you as well. So Julie, I will turn back to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Robin Rose. She holds a master's degree in counseling psych and psychology from Lewis and Clark College. And after 15 years as college faculty, she formed her own business, moved into working with public government agencies, nonprofit sector and the business sector. And Robin has trained thousands of individuals who wanted to learn how their brain works so they could think, act and communicate at their highest proficiency. 
For more than 30 years now, she's explored the frontiers of leadership and neuroscience. She teaches a rare scientific approach that translates brain science into practical and usable information that she'll share with us tonight. So as we plan for tonight's presentation, Robin's been just incredible to work with. She has a really uncommon ability to make it safe for individuals and groups to learn new ways to work together, to build trust, participate, and to move forward. And her passion is focused on sharing tools for reducing stress, improving relationships, and having great enthusiasm for life. So what she said to me is that she would want us to build our lives around joy and around community whistle our way to work that we feel good about and leave work at work and go home to the lives and the relationships that we all love. So I know you're going to enjoy listening to her tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Robin Rose. It will help if I unmute myself. Julie, thank you so much. Let me pull up tonight's slide deck. Hmm. Let me find. Well, as Julie just said, Robin Rose, a little tiny bit about me. I come to this work because in my 30s, I had a mental health challenge that was severe enough that I didn't leave my home for a couple of years. I was agoraphobic and um, I got help. And then I became very impassioned around understanding what's going on in the brain and the system, mentally, emotionally, and physically, when um, people become overwhelmed like I had. And so as a result of that, I have for the last 30 years been learning about, got my master's in counseling psychology, and so I really spend my time with a great passion for helping people understand how can we reduce stress? How can we cope a little bit better every day? Because those small steps all add up tremendously. And tonight we're gonna to talk about what are those simple things that we can build into our lives consistently um, because in the, the big picture, stress management or coping is about on the hour or twice a day. Can I calm my nervous system just a little bit? And so our hour is full of um, research back ways that you can use any of them, a couple of them, one of them to get that positive impact. So we're going to talk about how stress actually impacts us all very differently. They now know that our brains are as different as our fingerprints. And so how a circumstance might stress me or stress you can be incredibly different. And there's a tremendous amount of inequity in the stressors we are experiencing now. And so we'll look at how the stress in our lives can be impacting us. And then I wanna focus on coping strategies that will be helpful and look at them in three different areas, emotionally, mentally, and physically. And my wish for you is you'll receive all the information in the handout. So all this information and more, um, you'll be able to look back at. And my wish for you is that you find just one, two or three things, not, not more than that, that I did. That you can start with and do consistently. It's not as good as yours was. But. So one of the things right now that we know is that we are having very, very different types of stress and degrees of stress. And it's, it is um, influenced by a tremendous variation in circumstances and just to acknowledge that some of us are, um, gosh, we have heat and food and, and solid employment every day. And there are other people that are working every day, worried about housing, worried about social justice issues, and maybe working with um, higher levels of depression or anxiety or your parenting 
and being the teacher and trying to work from home. So as we talk about different strategies, I want to make sure that we acknowledge the stress that people are under is tremendously varied. And it impacts us differently. As I said earlier, our brains are really quite different. And so what might be really tough for me might be easy for you. And one of the things I'm always reminded of in the research is that um, it stress impacts us so differently. And yet we think typically that our stress could be tougher for us than for anyone else. So that's a normal thing that people often think when they feel overwhelmed. Stress tends to show up in our body, in our emotions and in our um, mental capacities. And so in the realm of the body, um, what's really typical is that as we get stressed, we can have increased number of tension or migraine headaches. We can have pain along the central nervous system. So neck pain, TMJ, upper back, low back or sciatica pain. Upset stomach is one of the most common signs of stress in children and in adults. Or we have fatigue and that loss of energy and passion. Stress is inflammatory to the body, so we can have an increased uh, achiness, joint pain. And then stress impacts our ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. It also can impact if we can focus with the ease that we normally do. So difficulty in concentrating is very normal when we get stressed. And then so are the three emotions that are common to stress, anxiety, depression, and chronic anger. So if you experience any of these, you, I, I'm sorry, but you're normal. Um, these are the top indicators, but it's not the complete list. But these are signals that my body is giving me um, or my emotions are giving me saying, oh, I'm too stressed. And so when I notice any of these for me, I always think about, oh, what's a coping strategy I could use right now to help my back relax or to help my stomach relax. And my goal this evening is for you to find a couple of those. And if you have any of these symptoms, they're a signal that your system is saying, can we reduce some stress right now? So I've broken these up this evening into what can we do physically, mentally, and emotionally as good coping strategies to um, reduce our stress, calm our nervous system. And what that also does is it causes different compounds to be released throughout the body. So the first one let's start with is what can we do physically? So I hope in this category, you can find one that appeals to you. The first one is remember to exhale fully. It's interesting when we inhale, we send the signal to the brain to get more energy but it's when we exhale that the brain sends the signal to our system to relax. And what science shows is that it takes the second long, slow, deep exhalation for the chemicals to begin to change in our system and that for that relaxation response to begin. So the first thing we can think about doing physically is monitor your breathing and can you remember to exhale more fully. Now, what I love about this is that there are all kinds of things that we can do that reduce our stress because they increase our exhalation. If you love to sing or when you yawn or laughter, they actually know that laughter is the fastest way to get an entire group or family to relax. Because when we laugh, we go ha, 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 exhale, exhale, exhale. 
And again, the exhalation is the part of the breath that brings the body out of defense and begins to reduce the stress and calm the nervous system. Do you love to hum or whistle? All of these increase your exhalation. And there's something else that we can do that increases our exhalation. And it's called aerobic exercise. So the term aerobic means with air. So even a five or 10 minute walk will change our stress level. It will greatly reduce it. And what research shows is that neuroscientists call the 10 minute walk, the 10 minute miracle, because so many neurochemicals and compounds are changed if we can take that 10 minute walk. And for some of us recently, those 10 minute walks have been around our homes or apartments, but they still count and you still get that benefit. Because when we, when we walk, we move our arms and legs, we begin to immediately breathe and we increase the blood flow across the big nerve in the, that goes across the skull, it's a corpus callosum. And we increase the blood flow and it helps us think more clearly in fact, NASA found that within, or after, I'm sorry, just 10 minutes of walking, our ability to think more calmly and accurately is increased by 150%. So if we're doing something like a 10 minute walk regularly, what they find is that it begins to reset our nervous system and we become more sensitive to pleasure and more resilient to stress. So even though a 10 minute walk doesn't seem like a lot, it actually has a very beneficial um, mark for our entire system. And we know that people that regularly get aerobic exercise like walking heal faster than people that don't. So I encourage people to consider finding um, a walking buddy or someone that um, might want to go on a short run. I'm not a runner, I'm a walker. But the science shows that even 10 minutes, three or four times a week, makes a marked difference. And after a culmination of 10 hours, there's measurable structural change in your brain and a more relaxed nervous system. So breathing, moving our body aerobically, and then something else that's to me so interesting about reducing stress. And then it has to do with what we're eating and how often we're eating. So one of the things that our brain needs is constant glycogen to have the energy to be able to think because glycogen is one of the forms of energy that your brain uses. And it turns out that brain cells are the only cells in our bodies that can't store energy. And when we're under stress, we can burn through that glycogen between two and four hours. So what we eat matters and how often we eat matters. So what, um, what they found for a reduced stress um, diet is to incorporate some whole foods along with processed food. The more processed food is, the more our glucose levels fluctuate and we can have a tendency to have more stress hormones, cortisol in particular. But when we have a balance of kind of whole food that hasn't been overly refined, you know, some fruits, vegetables, uh, proteins, in addition to refined foods, then we maintain a stable glucose level, which reduces our stress level. So I find it so interesting that what we eat during the day has a, can have a very positive impact on reducing our stress. And then, as I said earlier, we burn through that glycogen if we're stressed and we're in new or challenging situations and we can burn through it in as little as two and a half hours. 
So, but everyone burns through it in three to four hours. And so I encourage you to think about, oh gosh, those of you that are parents, you know this for our kiddos, they need to have some more calories every few hours. Otherwise we see behaviors because they don't have the impulse control because they don't have stable blood sugar. So the same is true for us as adults that when we're under stress, not a meal, but even 100 or 150 calories of a, a low processed kind of food, fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, um, you know, slice of bread with peanut butter on it will help stabilize the brain and we release less cortisol, which is the master stress hormone. There are nine stress hormones, but Cortisol determines how much of the other eight are going to be manufactured and released. So when we have stable glucose, we have reduced cortisol release. Something else that surprises people and surprised me when I first learned about this is the importance of hydration. Actually, as we drink the amount of fluids that our body needs during the day, it helps to rinse cortisol out of our system. And the standard understanding now is that each of us needs about half of our body weight in fluid ounces. So I'm 150 pounds these days, COVID 10 pound gain. So I need uh, about 75 ounces of water. Now, if you love tea and coffee and your body's used to tea and coffee for a long time, they said those are diuretics and they don't count. But the newer research is saying, yes, they do count towards your measurement of hydration. And a drop in hydration can have a significant impact in how clearly we think and how good we feel. Another, another statistic from NASA, they found that within 20 minutes of drinking just eight ounces of water, brain function is increased by 150%. So retention and memory and decision-making. So, so we're breathing, we're moving, we're thinking about stable uh, calories hydrating, and then we need to get sleep. The majority of the people that I ask in, in audiences across the country report getting about five to seven hours of sleep a night. And the research would suggest that if we can get seven to nine hours of sleep a night, it will help us reduce our stress. And here's why. We go through many different brain stages during our sleep. Um, if you look at this graphic, right now we're hopefully in about beta. So when we're really stirred up, when I am driving and I'm angry at someone else, it's just cut me off. Oh, I'm in a beta brainwave state. As I do some breathing and relax my body, probably change my thinking, I come into an alpha and that's the ideal state to be awake in because our muscles are more relaxed, but our brain is accurate and we are able to focus. But then as we enter the relaxed sleep stages, we go down first through theta and it's during theta that our brain consolidates what we wanna remember from today, which increases the accuracy of our short-term memory. And then we go into deep sleep and that's called, we're in Delta brainwave state. And that's when our immune system repairs and our brain detoxes. And then that's new information, understanding that that's really when our brain does the important work of releasing toxins. And that's why they say, gosh, if you're sick, go to bed and get some sleep because it's during deep sleep that we do our deepest healing and our cells regenerate. And then in the first six and a half hours of sleep, every 90 minutes, we come up into rapid eye movement sleep, REM, and this is when we'll dream. 
and whether we remember our dreams or not. But what is going on in our brain during REM sleep is we're working out our stressors. We're doing our problem solving. We're doing our conflict management. And what they know is that people that get adequate amounts of REM we learn more quickly, we solve our problems more quickly, and we can work with our stressors more easily. So in the first 6.6 .6 hours of sleep, it takes, and, and this is in the bell curve, this is for 90% uh, of people's sleep patterns. In the first 6.6 .6 hours, it actually takes 90 minutes to go through the cycle of theta, delta, and REM. But if we get those last two needed hours of sleep, which means we get up to eight and a half hours, this cycle speeds up and we go through it every three to five minutes. And so we get up to 100 times more of these very brain friendly body, body building, body kind of re-enhancing um, stages. And so the, the goal is if you can begin to get closer to seven hours, and if you're good at a power nap, that power nap counts as part of your overall amount of sleep within 24 hours. Okay, just a couple more for this first section. If you're a music lover, then please, you can just start here because we know that when we listen to music that we love, the, it's called entrainment, and the body literally matches that uh, cadence. And we can enter, if you listen to music without words, it's the only way they know, by the way, to massage the brain, music without words. And that frequently, a lot of, uh, a lot of music without words puts the brain in alpha. Um, if you listen to music that gets you up and moving and singing, or you listen to music that allows you to feel the important grief or sorrow that could be very prevalent in your life right now, music is a wonderful way to help our nervous system and our brain. And research shows that it takes 13 minutes of listening to music to help us not cover up or make sadness go away, but to more integrate it and then release it. And nine minutes to make us happy. Although I suspect that each of you has music that you love so much, it doesn't take nine minutes. For you music lovers, it might be just a couple minutes. So our first things that we've talked about, that ability to remember to exhale fully, to move our body, to feed our body stable, um, maintain stable glucose, to hydrate, to sleep, to listen to music. Those are some effective coping strategies that we look at as physical, um, starting with the body's needs. So, what we'd like to do now is to give you some time in, in the chat to be thinking about um, how can you tell when you're stressed and need to take care of yourself? How does your body signal you? It could be that tension in your face or tension in the stomach. Um, and any questions that you might have about the material that we've covered so far. And even more importantly, you bring expertise to our group tonight that I sure don't have. So your suggestions for what you do in the physical realm. And then after our, our time to process this, then we'll talk about the emotional and the, look at my brain having a moment and uh, the emotional and the mental realms mental. So we have people that are ready to um, read your questions and contributions in the chat. Who wants to start us, please? Robin, we've got a couple of comments and then I've got a couple of questions for you. So Doug mentioned uh, the number of years that he spent at the university's music 
department and for 24 years. And now he has an idea of how much the reason was why he felt so good working there. Uh, Maria mentions that some stress signs have been getting tearful quickly and starting to mix up words. And Leslie mentioned, I know I'm stressed when I find myself getting overly angry or frustrated. So those are some of the comments. Um, and then a, a couple of questions, and I'll ask for other folks to, uh, to jot some in here as well. Much of what you're talking about are things that would be very helpful in typical times. Is there anything that you've seen over the last year that, that people are particularly deficit um, in something that it's like, boy, this would be one thing that I see over and over again that people are missing out on that would really help their brains and their bodies? Yes. It is that ability to truly slow down for even five minutes, one time a day. Most of the people that I'm working with and working around right now have so much stress and they're taken on more than they had before. And so there's a very pressing schedule and people feel hurried and worried and they're learning so much and they're trying to help people and the people around them that are either overwhelmed in really tough situations, possibly ill. And what can happen is if I don't slow down, I'm always in fight or flight. I always am releasing all nine stress hormones. And it can be very challenging to think that I can take five minutes to just be still and listen to music or to do whatever brings you that quiet calm. It's the first thing we most of us let go of, including myself when it feels like there's too much on my plate, but it's the, it's the most important thing because I'm constantly in stress physiology if I'm constantly hurried or worried. So Robin, a couple of folks have mentioned their stress signs being irritable, lack of patience uh, for kids, misbehavior Els mentioned. I think that's something that a lot of us can relate to whether we have children or uh, other people that we give that we're doing caregiving for. So anything that you would suggest as we're trying to help other people who may be stressed, what are some things to help? And we'll go to like kid management or uh, aging parents to reduce some of the irritability and lack of patience that we feel in ourselves helping others. Yes, absolutely. I don't know how many people were ready for this incredible change in our relationships and the amount of time that we're spending together. Um, with children, within one twentieth of a second, children's brains read our emotional state. And so as parents or caregivers or grandparents, the more we can take one moment to get those two breaths and calm our nervous system. What the research shows, this happens, it's called interlocking limbic resonance, but we've all experienced this. When someone we look up to and your children are always looking up to you, someone we look up to when they come in and we're upset and they are calm and say, we'll figure this out we will have a moment of calm. Our shoulders will even come down because the way humans are, we look up for help. And, and we also, by the way, blame up when we're upset. But so kiddos are looking up and they notice what state we're in. And if we can calm ourselves, and this, I'm not saying that it is simple or easy. But the more we can calm ourselves and then say to them, let's take a walk while we talk about this, or we can figure this out. Let's get some crayons out while we talk about it. If you can have movement with children while you're trying to have a discussion, it gives them a little more what's called hemispheric synchronization and it calms the nervous system. And so we can have more positive impact by actually modeling this calm, which means parents, your, your self-care has never been more important and likely has never been more challenging time-wise to be able to find those couple minutes 
here and there to take good care of yourself. Thanks, Robin. Heidi mentioned, and a couple other folks have chimed in with the same comment and agreeing with this, that when I'm stressed and depressed, I become a hermit. I stop going places, I stop communicating with people outside my household, and I stop taking care of myself. A number of people mentioned community and connections. So any suggestions on how to break that, that cycle to leapfrog past and get back to some of those relationships of serving and being contributed to by other people to break out of that, that hermit in, inclination. Thank you. Heidi, I can't tell you how much I relate to that. Being agoraphobic and not leaving my home for two years, um, I still have those tendencies to be a hermit. So there are two things that I want to encourage you and everyone that can relate to this to, cons to think about. One is, it, uh, it's find your why. Um, what, whatever we do, what we do, whatever's motivating us, finding that why. And that allows a certain part of the brain, the limbic system to help us move forward and do what we want to do, but doesn't feel very inviting. So when you understand or think about why bother, why bother getting dressed? You know, the joke lately has been going from night pajamas to day pajamas. And I know a lot of people that are in their night pajamas 24 seven. And so figuring out why, why is it important to me? And that engages the motivation part of your brain. So it might be for my health, for my outlook on life, for my family. I don't know what your why is and all of our whys will be different. And the other, and so why, the W-H-Y. And the other thing I encourage you to consider is Think about one person that you feel safe with that could be kind of a check-in friend and um, ask that person or tell that person if they're willing how often it would be helpful if they check in with you, whether it's a text once a day so you have that connection or if they can meet in a, um, a park and walk for five minutes or having a buddy that feels safe um, for gentle accountability. And as you know, because you're talking about the importance of it, uh, it can feel very hard to get out. And then once we've done it, it's amazing how much we're glad we did it later. Um, and, and I just have to add this third part. Love the part of you that struggles getting outside love and support that part of you that that is finding it just tough right now offering that compassion and that support to ourselves is very important and the last thing we want to do is to be getting after ourselves or shaming ourselves because we feel overwhelmed or stressed right now or don't bring our best parenting or our best grandparenting or yeah so the more we offer ourselves the love and support than the, the two core human needs from, from conception till our death is our need to feel safe and loved. And um, that ability when we really feel up against our stuff to offer that to ourselves can be uh, helpful and comforting and remove some of the layer of not being able to get up and go out. Robin, I've got a couple of comments and then a question as we wrap up this portion here. Um, Marcy mentioned loss of zest is a perfect phrase, loss of concentration and interest. Lynn mentioned a gut feeling, particularly lower GI. Um, Jill mentioned frustration with children. Uh, Ashley said, when I'm stressed, I become a bit short-tempered and easily teary-eyed. Mm -hmm. And then Casa has the question, does stress result in depression? Ah, uh, thank you. I want to make one comment about tears and then let's talk about stress and depression. Um, uh, when we cry, um, in, in 2006, Nobel Prizes were given to two scientists that identified that when we get really stressed, there's a protein that breaks down 
and the, the byproduct, the derivative of protein is very toxic and it only comes out through tears. So uh, crying when we need to cry is extremely important. And so onions, that kind of crying is not the same, but crying from grief or sadness or stress or overwhelm, um, that is part of our body's built-in healthy mechanism to release some of the stress. And many of you have had the experience of having a good cry and then feeling better afterwards because a lot has actually happened in our brain. So I would, if you're one of your body's stress management styles is to have those tears, I would, I would honor it. Um, and then can stress lead to depression? Oh, we have two minutes. It's going to take this whole piece. So depression, if we look at, we you know do blood draws, whether it's chronic or acute, so long term, or uh, acute is six months or less, is generally a component of higher levels of cortisol in the system, along with some other uh, neurotransmitters and chemicals. When we are more stressed, we have more cortisol in the system. So it can exacerbate. Um, when we're more stressed, we also have more adrenaline in the system. And um, for those of us that have really high levels of anxiety, that has much to do with adrenaline. So as we have more of the cortisol and adrenaline that are increased during stress, if we have a tendency towards anxiety or depression, yes, we will. It's a very normal experience to see an increase in um, the way our body expresses that and those feelings. And which is why stress management then um, can reduce the experience of anxiety and depression and the chronic anger. Chronic anger, usually we see an increase in both the cortisol and the adrenaline. And so as simple as it sounds, some people feel like it's, oh, breathing, it can't be that simple. Well, if we go to the research, it, oxygen is the number one thing our brain needs to relax and come out of stress. And so the more we can integrate stress management techniques, um, we reduce our experience of anxiety and cortisol and that chronic anger. It's a great question, thank you. Robin, if I can give you one more comment here, and I think it will lead into what you're going to, to say next. I just have to say, those of you participating, being part with us this evening, we deal with a lot of things as a community, but I tell you, some of your, your leadership and your boldness has come through most strongly during this time and you being vulnerable in sharing these things this evening. I am so very grateful for each of you, and, and this statement would epitomize this, then I'll turn to you, Robin. It took me a while uh, to recognize how badly I've been impacted by the stress of this extended pandemic lockdown. It is deep, deep depression, but perhaps what others might not recognize as depression because I still feel it's because I still appear functional. I'll turn to you, Robin, for your next section. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for that. Our next section is the one that I couldn't think of for a minute. And I have to joke at myself because mentally I couldn't remember that it was the mental component. So one of the things that's so important is to really think about the, um, how we can take good care of ourselves mentally. And many people are aware of what they feed their body. And I think it's just as important or even more so what we feed our mind because um, your, your brain is hardwired to go after whatever it is you identify that you want. So we've, a lot of people have heard the expression, what you think about, you bring about. Well, that's actually accurate because your brain is hardwired to go after what you say you want, whatever you talk about, what, what you focus on on a regular basis. And there's something in all of our systems after the age of eight months, and it's called the negativity bias. We're wired, we're hardwired to really see a lot of the negative rapidly, and it's harder to get rid of the negative. We remember it longer and more than it is the positive. 
And even though, you know, the research shows by 10 o'clock in the morning, most of us have had between 350 to 2,000 successes. Most of us don't remember those 2,000 successes. So when someone says, how's your day going? Whoa, oh, we can remember the person that cut us off or the worry that my electrical bill is going to be cut off. But we don't don't even begin to remember that things like, oh, my ankles have worked every step. Oh, my kids are well today. Oh, I, I have milk in the refrigerator today. We tend, because of that negativity bias, what gets our brain's attention, and it's actually a safety device because our brain doesn't want us to miss out on anything that could be really impactful or scary. But if we don't have balance with this negativity tendency, then we become negative all the time. And the research shows that 98% of most of our thoughts when we get highly stressed, if we don't begin to work with it and notice it, they become negative. And we begin to project what could go wrong or what's wrong today. And we literally miss out on what is also working. And so, Beginning to catch this is really important because your brain's number one job is your safety. Every four seconds, your brain scans for safety. That is what keeps us alive. And if my thinking is fear-based or always projecting that something terrible is going to happen, my brain is listening to that. And within eight seconds of having fear-based conversations or thoughts, if my brain thinks, oh, I'm under attack, something terrible is going to happen, it floods my system with the norepinephrine, cortisol, adrenaline, my nervous system ramps up, and I'm in fight or flight, and I'm completely stressed just from my thoughts. So this section is about being able to recognize when I've gotten caught up in worrying, Mm -hmm. and being able to slow it down and have other thoughts as well. And this is kind of a goofy example, but please play along with this. So, but this is kind of what, how whatever we focus on really determines what our brain goes after. So would you please take a moment and would you look around the room you're in and would you notice everything that is the color blue? I'm going to give you 15 seconds, and then I'm going to ask you to please close your eyes and make a list. So go for blue. Thank you. Would you please close your eyes now? everybody. And would you please now make a list of everything you just saw that was silver, red, or green. And what most people notice is their brain did what we asked it to do. It remembers blue. And that's how our brains work. Our brains can't afford to make us wrong. And so whether we're accurate or not, it doesn't matter to our brain. Our brain is just going to go after what we focus on. And so when we're stressed, it is critically important to watch our focus and our perception because it really changes whether our nervous system can calm down and feel capable or feel totally upset and we're constantly in stress physiology. And so our focus and mindset literally determines how we move forward. If we believe things can work out, if we believe I can figure it out, then the brain goes into that solution focus. It, uh, we increase blood flow to the neocortex and the prefrontal cortex. But if I'm positive, everything is terrible. It'll never work out. It's going to get even worse. Then my brain, the blood flow goes to the non-thinking part of the brain, the brain stem. And that's where um, we all have the stress reactions. And so we are stressed. There's so much going on that is huge. 
as often as we can to bring our thinking to it that supports us. And I am not talking about positive thinking. And I, I love, there are so many wonderful people are able to be positive and, um, but I'm not talking about positive thinking here. I, it's not like saying, oh, I'm fine. No, it's actually, it's not fine. It's tough, it's hard. But what we wanna do, and by the way, when we actually tell our truth and say, this has really been tough, we become what's called biochemically congruent. Our words match our inside experience. The brain comes out of defense and we get a free dose of our opiates, serotonin and endorphins. That those are the chemicals we want more of. So we wanna tell our truth by being able to say what my truth is. And I wanna encourage us to really think about not using positive thinking, but choosing capable thinking because it is tough. And we'll figure pieces out. It's big and you are bigger. So that ability to kind of hire that inner coach. You know, if we all could get a coach right now that would be able to say, hang in there, give it one more try, take good care of yourself, take a breath now. And so using our internal dialogue as an inner coach um, changes our nervous system and our chemistry. So I want to encourage each of you to design kind of a go-to uh, calming statement that works for you. And that's going to be totally different for everyone here. And if you put your name in it, new research shows it goes to a deeper, even more effective part of the brain. But when you feel overwhelmed or angry, what is your go-to statement? What is your inner coach? What grounds you? So that's really important for all of us to have. And it's very common for people to not have this. Um, so my wish for you is to find a couple and then um, write them down. Because I, well, I'll just grab one off. I. I probably have 30 to my left right here. And when I find myself perseverating or going into my old pattern of anxiety, I, I watch those thoughts and I'm starting to get worried and I'm, I'm kind of recycling a story and I'm getting myself upset. I have something written down that I can look over and remind myself, okay, I do my best at this moment and that's all I can do. And even as I say that right now, I can feel my body calming down. So I want each of you to consider finding one that would be your go-to self-coaching, self-support statement because our mindset makes all the difference. And just a quick comment about, it's very common right now to be in conversations where people are very upset and we kind of start repeating stories of upset and your ability to kind of balance out how much to do of that because it activates the nervous system and the brain and in the same way kind of um, paying uh, too much attention to the news or social media. It's um, those thoughts, what we're feeding our brain through our own internal dialogue, conversations in media, is important always, but when we're highly stressed, it's incredibly important. And then gratitude. So neuroscientists find that there are six things that measurably change the structure of the brain. So if we hook people up to um, a, a unit that can measure a brain formation and structure, they find that, and I'll give you the six. One is that ability to breathe, especially when you're uncomfortable, that long exhalation. Getting um, up to seven hours of sleep, that aerobic movement, stable glucose, and gratitude is, makes the top six. And the last one we'll get to in the next section. So it turns out we can't be grateful and be in fight or flight at the same time. 
So one of the practices that people really are working with right now in the thick of so much stress is figuring out what's, what are some of the small things that we are grateful for. And even right now, if each of you would be willing to think about one thing right now and go for something small, what are you grateful for right now? Um, and if you want to put it in the chat, that would be lovely and, and you don't need to. But it turns out when you take your mindset, it's like going for the color blue. When you think about, I'm grateful right now that my internet is working. Um, it was actually down for two thirds of the day today and it was just crossed fingers that it would be back up by five o'clock and it was. So I'm grateful for that. Well, just, just doing that right now changed chemistry in my system. And they're just little tweaks, but I want to remind you a culmination of 10 hours. And if we hook us up to an fMRI, we see greater blood flow to the left prefrontal cortex. And that's where we tremendously benefit from having that highway of a neural network. And so consider how could you bring in just moments of gratitude? Okay, I'm checking my time because I have a tendency to talk a lot. And we're coming to what is one for me, one of the most important sections. And so in the midst of really challenging times, how do we take a good care of ourselves emotionally? And I labeled it as a tend to our heart, but we are social beings and we need others to be happy and well. We know that the brain only grows and heals when we're in connection with someone else with whom we feel loved by and safe with or valued by and respected by. And so this is really important for our emotional well-being. And I add in this section, just kind of re a reminder to be really thinking about, oh, in the midst of some people physically isolating, socially isolating, having not seen beloveds for maybe much of this year, what can we do? What are we doing to have connection? Because we need that. One of our most important core needs when we're stressed and in the thick of pain and grief and despair is to have someone that can hear us, someone we feel safe with and we can express our pain to them and our uncomfortable feelings and they won't try and fix it. They won't make it about them. Now, I don't wanna suggest we all have friends like that. I know that I have a beloved friend. You know, in our lifetime, we all only have one to three best friends. Being an introvert, I thought everybody had 10 or 20 and if something was wrong with me that I just had two or three, no, one to three. And sometimes we have to teach people and we have to um, just say, I really like to talk about something I'm going through and please, you don't need to fix it, but I would really appreciate your sitting with me and hearing it. And this is really important for our emotional needs always and especially now. It's also critical that we're doing things where we experience laughter and joy. And what, what is that for you? It, it's going to be different for all of us. It could be that music. It could be going for a walk with our child. Or it could be coming together and having maybe even having to have a meal over Zoom together. But I'd like you to think about what are you doing that's charging your batteries. You'll know it's called, actually, it's called U-stress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. And you'll know it's good for you because you look forward to it. And it's like, oh, I might even plan this meal with this person, or I can hardly wait for the walk or the conversation, or we're going to sit down and watch that funny show together. There'll be some anticipation of it and then some pleasure from it. And that's very important to make sure that we're continuing to have this in our lives right now. I mentioned self-compassion earlier. Some of you might've heard of this. Um, there are a couple 
people recently that have been doing a lot of work around self-compassion, um, Kristen Neff and Brene Brown, two, two people that have doctorates. And Kristen Neff is at Harvard and it's interesting, she's really a scientist. She's not a feel good psychologist. And what they found is that for people in stress and for people that have PTSD, our ability to support ourselves with kindness, especially when we make mistakes or we feel like we've flubbed up is one of the most effective coping strategies because many of us tend to beat up on ourselves and that's the last thing we want to do. So this is a time when I know our parenting and our grandparenting and whatever we're doing is, is not like it normally is when we have more patience. But that ability to even in that moment extend kindness and graciousness to ourselves and others is very important. And to find those people, to find those people that believe in us, it might just be, you know, we, some of us might just have those one or two people that we would open up to or share anything with, but to think about who are they and then find ways to spend time with them. For lots of people, it's through even texting right now or Zoom or video chat of some kind. Now I want to do a, a quick dive into feelings because one of the things that happens when we're stressed is we have such strong and uncomfortable feelings and it is critical that we can allow ourselves to feel our feelings and right now grief is one of the strongest feelings and it's very important that we learn how to feel that. So I'm going to do just a little bit of um, information about that. So one of the things that I think is so interesting is that emotions have a cycle. And we usually have a strong emotion because there's been a problem. And the tendency is to try and go solve the problem, which we're good at, you're good at. But solving the problem that created the emotion doesn't complete the cycle. So we can still have that emotion. And this is why we all have beloved friends that are still talking about that divorce eight years ago or 28 years ago, because they solved the problem, but they didn't complete the cycle. And so they're still carrying that stress. And um, so it's important to be able to complete the cycle after we've had strong emotions because this time has been tough enough for everyone. We don't want to carry this, this year, let alone all of the incredibly um, tough forms of injustice and inequity and, and discrimination that people have been working through for well, decades and centuries that as much as we can resolve the emotion, it also then frees up the thinking portion of the brain to work even deeper on the problem. So unprocessed emotions drain us. So let's just talk about some easy, healthy ways to complete the cycle of an emotion. And um, we've already discussed some of these. So one of it is when you can name what you're feeling and breathe, it turns out that feelings in our body only last for 90 seconds. And so if you can name, I feel so angry, I feel humiliation, I feel furious, and then get my breath and continue to breathe and just notice how I feel it in my body. Because feelings, um, they just wanna be felt, not put away. Something else we can do is if we're feeling anxious, then it's helpful to slow down or lie down and do like a relaxation moment, five minutes, that quiet music. But if it's anger, better to move the body. Go do that 10 minute walk, rake some leaves, move your body because we're moving out, um, dispersing different chemicals. Or go share it with a friend and receive that support. All of these will complete the emotion cycle in a healthy way. Um, 
for some of you that have martial arts or you like to do yoga, Tai Chi, or you know, you know, tapping, tapping is a form of quieting the part of the brain, the fire alarm, the amygdala. So tapping on those pressure points. And then finally, we talked about earlier, allowing ourselves a good cry. So when you find yourself having a strong emotion, it is, it will uh, resolve more quickly if we do something proactive to help it run its needed cycle. And then finally, in the thick of it right now, when I, for, for many people, it's harder to do this. The goal is in our lives is to really build our lives around what we love and our joy. So to the degree that you can find out something you love and do more of it. And sometimes that's only going to be for five minutes a day and maybe 15 minutes on the weekend. But remember your brain can't make you wrong. Did you know that the brain doesn't know the difference between real or imagined? So when you even imagine doing something that you love, you get the calming in the nervous system and you get the benefit of the stress reduction. So quite a list of things that we've talked about. Welcome back. Thank you for sharing your ideas and thoughts in your break room. I am sorry that I don't have a insight into all of the wisdom that you've brought and shared. Thank you. So a lot of information. And what I want to encourage you to do is to think about starting small. So what the research tells us is that it has to, in order to, the quality right. of our day is determined the by the quality of our no sense. The bubbles? No, he didn't see it right. Don't put on your clothes. So, so what I would wish for all of us is to find one or two things, and, and really just one or two, and chunk it down into something that is so small that you're going to be successful. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to breathe for five minutes, oh, no, 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 four breaths, just four. And set that up, do it, and do it for five days in a row. And it has to be pleasurable to be sustainable. But the way we form these new patterns is to find something, start small, chunk it down small enough that we are immediately successful. Some brand new research is talking about, we have to feel good about the effort to wanna to do it again tomorrow. And so, if we, it's kind of like New Year's resolutions where I say, I'm going to work out 90 minutes a day, five days a week. Well, that lasts for about one day. And so the research is showing we want to decide, okay, I'm going to go for a 10 minute walk and do it and feel good about it. And that sets me up for wanting to do it again. And then the other key ingredient, we want it small so that we're successful and we feel good. And then to do it consistently. So please choose something that's really doable in the midst of your busy lives right now. And if it's a match for you, consider finding a buddy for a check-in, you know, text in, check in through text or say, hey, you know, by four o'clock today, I'm going to drink um, all four of my glasses of water or whatever your goal is going to be. And focus on what is in your control. Do what you can do. Uh, let the rest of this go. You know, you'll get the handout. You'll have all these lists of ideas. Focus on the ones that you can do right now. And I just want to remind us all to feel and honor the feelings that are coming up right now in this stressful time, in particular, the uncomfortable ones. Feelings buried alive never die. They just come up later as illness or anger or frustration or overwhelm. And so feelings can be tough to actually honor and feel and breathe and take a walk and let that cycle go through. 
but there's never been a more important time to actually let them go through us so they can move on. And then my last thought to you, although we'll be here for questions and answers for the next 15 minutes, please find what brings you joy. And if you can't do it right now, do it in your mind. Your brain doesn't know the difference between real or imagined and you deserve joy on a daily basis. I appreciate you so much for taking the time to be here tonight. Um, I'm just quick mention before I pass this over to Mark, there will be in, in your slides, there are these extra pieces where you can uh, kind of fill out and do some reflecting and writing if you so choose. Be well. Here's to you, Mark, and then I'm going to be around for question and answers. Thank you. I'm going to be very brief so we can have more time with Robin, but um, just thank you community and individuals for coming out and having a conversation uh, together about some very important things. Um, the city and your community and your community that may be a couple time zones away care for you very, very much. And we're just, our hearts are lifted by having you here and, and having this important discussion together. Um, a couple things, as, as Robin said, uh, Julie will send out the PowerPoint and that resources list. Also want to let you know, conversation that will continue some of the same topic, but in a, in a different way is Cultural Conversations Forum, Evening Forum on March 24th. And the title of that is More Stories from the Heart. Uh, and then also, Teresa, if you could go to our slide, um, here is our email address. If you have any questions uh, for the four of us in neighborhood outreach, or we can connect you to other folks in neighborhood services, but also if you'd like to get signed up for neighborhood news, which is one of the ways to learn about what's happening in the community and that the, uh, uh, that the city is doing as well. So Robin, I'm gonna come back to you and um, Shane, if you could unmute, please. Um, we'll go Shane and then Brandy and then Marcy if you could each ask your question. So Shane, if you could ask your question that you had in the chat, please, we'd love to hear that and, and have Robin's response. So Shane. Um, I just wanted to know whether or not that um, there was a difference in response to the pandemic between introverts and extroverts that someone noticed. Oh, Shane, that's such a good question. And I have not read any research that's addressed that. But now, now I'm going to look at that. I'll see what I can find. And um, I don't know if I send that to Julie, if it can get passed on to you. Sure. Um, it's a great question. And then I would just say anecdotally, so this is just me. My introverted friends have seemed to be the folks that have reached out to me more so than in the past, I was always the one that reached out to them. Again, I'm talking eight or 10 people, but I've seen more so that my introverted friends have had more felt needs during this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Brandy, if we can go to your question about music, please. Sure, um, I was really interested in that idea of entrainment and I, I mean, it'll be different for everyone, I realize, but do you know of any music that like kind of would help us get into that entrainment? Like, for example, I noticed that slide was Yo-Yo Ma and I was like, oh, that would be great. Uh, yes. Um, so it depends what you want to entrain to. So uh, for example, a music that has 58 to 62 beats per minute entrains the brain, the brain wants to match up and it will go to an alpha brainwave state. So the body relaxes, the mind comes out of defense. It's great if you're a parent to play that 30 minutes before bedtime. So children's bodies begin to relax. But if you're wanting to get some energy and maybe go get yourself to go for a walk or clean the house, then you would want to bump it up. And I can't tell you right now exactly how many beats per minute we want there, 62, but it's going to be in that 80 to 90. And then, and that literally our system entrains to music in that way. And so it depends what you want. There's lots of wonderful research and information about not only what, um, what music 
will entrain to what brain states or what mood or what music can be helpful for uh, getting more energy or uh, becoming more calm. Was that helpful at all? Super helpful. Thank you very much. That beats per minute. Yeah. And, and I just want to, um, because I'm really into, uh, it's so important right now to, to allow our feelings to have healthy expression. For um, any of us that have had much loss or grief, it is really helpful to find music that allows us to find um, an expression of that grief or tears. It's also helpful, by the way, to find movies that if, um, you know, crying is a very important thing to be able to do if we've had significant loss or grief. And music and um, uh, emotional movies can be very helpful, and very uh, helpful in a healing sense to be able to help the body kind of release um, what it needs to release. And then it literally frees the brain to come out of fight or flight and settle into mm -hmm. a more balanced physiology. Mm -hmm. Marcy, if you could unmute and we'll go to your question, please. Marcy McReynolds. Yeah, it's like, okay, all the intention in the world, the yoga mats on the floor, there's the everything set up between the intention and getting down there and doing it some wall of resistance. Mm -hmm. How do you overcome that wall of resistance? Well, I would start by loving the part of you that wants to and loving the part of you that doesn't want to. And to <laughs> truly honor and accept every part counts. And whatever that whole idea of um, whatever we resist persists or feelings buried alive, never die. We, that part of us that is just fed up and doesn't want to, deserves to be felt and expressed and supported and validated as much as the part of us that wants to go do that 10 minute walk right now. And so um, I would consider maybe starting with just a daily two minute check-in and loving the part of yourself that really doesn't want to get on the yoga mat and uh, to really validate and honor that part of you. Because uh, most of us are taught to get rid of that part and that part's alive and well in most of us. Um, and mm -hmm. as we accept all of us, we integrate with greater ease. And so then we can move with the part that's um, in resistance and the part that's in excitement and accept both of them because we are that balance of things. And the other thing is, then find something that is so small that um, it doesn't even take the yoga mat. It might be that you sit in the chair and you lean all the way forward and touch your toes and you decide you're going to do that three times. Okay. And it's stretch your low back, chunk it down so it's sm so small that you'll be successful or that you tell yourself, I'm only going to do it for three minutes. I don't want to do it, but I'll only do it for three minutes. I love the part of me that doesn't want to do it, but I'll do it for three minutes. And then just, <laughs> just start there. Okay. No, no getting after ourselves if we don't get it done, but make it so small that we can. Thank you. We'd love to have one more uh, question and I'll let uh, Robin give one final word and, and Julie to wrap up. Uh, but one clarification, if you could, Robin, if you could go back to the amount of water that's recommended oh. for a day. We had a little bit of confusion on that. If you could clarify, please. Thank you. Take your body weight and divide that in half. That's a number of ounces a day that is the standard recommendation. So half our body weight in ounces, 150 pounds, I need 75 ounces. And then if you're um, you know, in the summer, if we're outside or we're really sweating a lot, we need to bump it up some. But that is the standard research right now for adequate hydration. Deal. So 120 pounds would be 60 ounces a day. So Robin, one last thing, what do you wanna say? And then I'll let Julie say goodbye for all of us. What would you like oh. to say at the end, Robin? Yeah. I hope that as you close your eyes tonight and I wish for you good sleep, that you can take, that you will take a moment and acknowledge yourself 
and for everything you bring and who you are, not even for what you've done. Thank you for showing up. That's more work than most people realize. And thank you for not only showing up, but for giving of yourself to others. And so please recognize that always you are so much more than enough, that you are important. We need you. And um, I appreciate you. So however you can offer that to yourself um, as you go to sleep at night, the thoughts we have before we go to sleep is what our brain tends to work on. So thoughts of self-support or thoughts of your well-being or your desired well-being um, are, are helpful to end our day with. Thank, thank you. you. So all of staff that have been on with us, thank you so much. And Julie, thank you for organizing this. We've had some great conversations with Robin and explained to her a little bit of our community and what, what we're feeling as staff as well. So Julie, I'll give you the final word and then we'll say farewell to all of you and look forward to seeing you soon. Julie. The final word, I mostly want to just thank Robin for sharing all of her inspiration with us tonight. And I guess my final word is it was really nice to have an event where we didn't talk about traffic or cutting down trees <laughs> or the power being out. So it was really great to be able to let people focus on what they need and um, get some some ideas of how to better manage in this difficult time. And I'm glad that we could come together and provide that tonight. And thank Robin for being such a wonderful resource and great presenter. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night, all. We're always glad to hear from each of you. So please don't hesitate. You see our email there at the bottom. <laughs>